latest edition of Agribiz. The great protein gamble. Elk producers see a velvet future. Plowing for profits and the science of soil. Hello and welcome to Agribiz. We begin with the land. How can fields be best used and how the process of farming help the land to help the producers? Field tests are starting to show that tillage is often the answer. Mechanical tillage in fallow areas to reduce weeds and prepare crops for seeding is a widespread practice on the prairies. But the cost has been soil erosion and fewer nutrients in the soil. Erosion is a problem. Soils cannot retain as much moisture and nitrogen levels are reduced. Zero tillage is a solution worth considering. The main concern with zero and minimum tillage is really is conserving the resources, the soil, primarily. So that's what, what we're looking at here, is trying to find ways to better conserve the soil and hopefully at the same time improve the economic returns for farmers. Tilling to control weeds is costly in terms of soil erosion and drying plus an increase in labor and operating costs for equipment. And they're moving more to substituting herbicides for that tillage. And the, the idea there is that by doing that, we can conserve trash on the soil surface, protect the soil from wind and water erosion, and save energy costs associated with all the fuel that we're burning with our tillage. The expected results are improved yields and lower input costs. There are three major soil areas in Saskatchewan, black soils in the north, dark brown, and brown in the south. Zero or minimum tillage in the three soils has produced varied results. If you look at the overall performance, um, zero and minimum tillage have the greatest potential economic benefit, uh, at least displayed benefit, in the park belt or the black soil zone. Uh, it's an area where we have the greatest amount of precipitation, we have the greatest crop diversification uh, in place as compared to the brown soil zone, or our area here. The differences in the results are partially explained by differences in the area's soils and tillage practices. Areas with greater moisture till more. The black soil zone averages six to eight times each year. So they use a lot of tillage. So if they can substitute herbicides for some or all of that tillage, they can save substantially or potentially a very large amount because there's eight tillage operations that they could save the fuel and the labor and the machine use and investment in that machinery. Besides reduced input costs, higher yields increase the return on investment. We, we see it largely for crops other than cereals, particularly crops like peas, lentils, flax, we see very significant yield advantages in the range of 10 to 15 percent higher yields with zero minimum till. Moving into the dark brown soil zone, the advantages of zero till are not as clear. But in the dark brown soil zone, because we till less, our cost of production for zero till are actually somewhat higher. But that's offset to some extent by the higher yields. We're still getting a six or nine percent yield advantage. So one counteracts the other. So the bottom line in the dark brown soil zone is that conservation tillage is equal or marginally better than conventional tillage. The southern brown soil zone is the driest. Here producers use a wheat fallow rotation, usually tilling three times each season. So the potential saving with zero tillage is less. But there are other factors. Some unique problems with weed control with zero till. One of the main problem weeds we have is foxtail barley, and it comes in very strongly in our zero-till systems after about three or five years. So if you're going to rely totally on herbicides, this can become very expensive to control that particular weed problem. Zero-till does increase the amount of moisture in the soil anywhere from one quarter to one inch, but grain yields stay the same. Under a continuous wheat system, we generally see even more. We see about an inch of additional water with no till as compared to conventional till. Now again, we have the same problem. We're not seeing this additional water being translated into higher grain yields, higher wheat yields. With some changes, producers in the brown soil zone could realize economic benefits using minimum tillage practices. If we're looking at 
trying to extend the adoption of conservation tillage in the brown soil zone, we have to look at changing our farming practices, moving away from monoculture wheat and from a fallow wheat system to a longer rotation and to a more diversified cropping system. And I think if we can do that successfully, then I think zero till will definitely be more profitable just like it is in the, in the black soil zone. Zero and minimum tillage practices improve soil conservation, but the economic benefits vary depending on soil type. The practice is already accepted outside Canada. Uh, if you go to other countries like Australia, it's widely used there for wheat production uh, in Australia. It's been well been used in Europe, in parts of Europe, both for cereals and for some of the row crops. And again, it, it, the, the motivation for this really depends on, on a, the economics of the situation at that particular time and the concerns people have with the environment. Throughout the prairies, reducing tilling preserves soil fertility and moisture. The challenge now is to make those advantages available in all soil types. Stay with us. Interesting things are still coming up. Many crop producers use laboratory analysis of their soil to make production decisions for their fields, but how exactly is the content of soil figured out? In this first of a two-part series, we go behind the doors of the soil lab to meet the machines and the people that do the science. Meet Gary Winkleman. He's been analyzing the chemical breakdown of plants and soil for over 20 years. And meet the nitrogen carbon sulfur analyzer, one of the many machines Gary and his associates use in the soil sciences lab at the semi-arid Prairie Agricultural Research Station in Swift Current. Um, this piece of equipment that we're looking at here is the uh, nitrogen carbon sulfur analyzer. It's made by Carl Herb uh, Instruments out of Italy. Uh, are basically, for our purposes, we use it for soil and plant samples, for nitrogen and carbon mainly, and on occasion for sulfur. To make sure the analysis is accurate, the soil must be ground for four hours, then run through 100 mesh sieves before being divided into tiny 15 milligram samples. We can put 64 samples in this tray, and you, you'll notice that some of them are open. Some of the rows of samples are, are open, haven't been trimmed. These are our tin capsules with the sample placed on the inside and the ones that are open we'll, we'll next treat them with acid and allow them to be treated with acid under different conditions and to remove the uh, inorganic carbon. The inorganic carbon is removed, goes off, comes off as carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Then we will seal those and uh, they'll be ready to go on the, uh, on the analyzer. The sample is injected into the oven where it's burned for analysis. This one temperature, even though I can touch it, runs at 1,000 degrees Celsius. There is a glass column, a quartz column that runs through and it contains chemicals. The sample is dropped onto the top of the column. Uh, 10 milliliters of pure oxygen is injected into the system causing flash combustion, raises the temperature to 1,800 degrees Celsius and the sample is completely burnt and put placed into a gaseous state. The gas is carried through with helium. We have a helium carrier gas that comes out the bottom a tube in the bottom into this part of the, of the analyzer. We have a scrubber that sits right on the inside here which removes any water vapors that may be present in that flow of gas. And from there, the sample goes into the back here, which is a gas chromatograph. A thermal detector sends a signal to the computer and the final output is recorded on the screen. Okay, the, the large peak that you see on the screen is the uh, carbon peak, represents the carbon coming off the analyzer. The peak just to the left of that, a very small peak, sort of looks like a rough bump on the bottom of the baseline. That's the nitrogen for the sample. Uh, the trace that's moving across the bottom of the screen, right near the, the bottom of the black part there, the trace is uh, the baseline of the reading that the instrument is giving us. Uh, in this area is where we detect sulfur, there was sulfur coming off, and you can see there's no change in Although it takes such a long time to prepare the soil, the actual test run takes only six minutes. Typical soil samples will run one to one and a half percent carbon and about ten times that for nitrogen. We have much more to come.
livestock industry in Western Canada is starting to look different. Tight margins have prompted many producers to look at alternatives, and a growing livestock option is elk. It's a different market. I don't know where Lady is. She may be up with the trail. Come on! Barry Hobrick has been in the elk producing business since 1990. He now manages over 400 head near Hodgeville, making his operation the biggest in southwestern Saskatchewan. Barry decided to get into the business for a change of lifestyle. The ad held down what he calls a regular job for 15 years with highways and transportation. Now on a global scale, the largest producers are in New Zealand, Russia and China. But Canada has become known as an up-and-comer to be reckoned with. The latest elk herd estimates in this country has Alberta with the largest number of elk at 5,700. Saskatchewan comes in a close second, only lagging slightly behind at 5,500. Currently, there are over 100 farms in Saskatchewan, and that number is growing quickly. As in many occupations, there are several ways to get into the field. There's kind of three different ways. You can either, you know, actually raise them like we're doing here, or uh, we have some investors uh, people that will buy animals and leave them, will look after them on a share basis for them uh, with the calf crop share, so much to us, so much to them. Uh, we'll take care of the marketing or they can take care of their own marketing. It's however however the investor wants to do it. And the other way is is that uh, some guys will take uh, and just invest money and uh, the farmer will guarantee them a percentage of return on their money. Operation costs are not too expensive compared to cattle production, and there's not much labor. Their uh, eating habits are, are good, like they eat more through the summer. Um, come fall and the wet weather gets cold, their metabolism slows down, and uh, the feeding in the winter is uh, very minimal. You know, once your fences are built and, uh, you know, labor-intensive, it isn't really once your fences are built. Uh, after that, they basically look after themselves as long as you feed them. Uh, it's more management than after that, trying to find your market. In Canada, the two primary products are breeding stock, the most lucrative, and velvet, or fresh antler. Breeding stock is generally sold as heifer calves, exposed heifers, meaning one that hasn't given birth yet, and exposed cows. There is also demand for breeding bulls of superior genetics. The velvet's harvested, uh, the bigger bulls, the bigger horns, uh, towards the uh, middle to the end of May, and then from there on the younger bulls come in uh, mostly all through June. It's the end of July and the hawbricks are just coming out of their busy time. The velvet is harvested, already sold, and ready for pickup and delivery to the Pacific Rim. The Asian market is the backbone of the velvet industry. It's used by Asian consumers for medicinal purposes as well as an aphrodisiac. These are have been selling for about $50 a pound. This is about a, well, a pound and a half, so it'd be about $75. From what I've seen when I was in, in Seoul is that they'll, uh, it's dried and then it's sliced there. It's mixed with ginseng or uh, you know, different herbs, Chinese herbs, they, they import all kinds of stuff and they use this in their traditional medicine. Uh, in Canada here it's used, it's sliced as well, but it's mainly used in uh, the ground up and put into a pill form. Canadian elk producers only supply about 2% of the Asian velvet market, but Hoprick says that they now have a good reputation for quality, which is more important than quantity to Asian buyers. We finally got a Canadian identity in uh, in Korea and they, they like our velvet, they view Canada as a clean country. Our velvet used to be taken from here to New Zealand and dried in New Zealand and sloughed off as New Zealand product which the Koreans tell us is maybe not as superior product as what we grow here. But Now we have our own identity, uh, I think we're going to be in the market for a long time. Elk producers are very independent when it comes to selling. There is no marketing board in place and selling isn't that difficult anyway. Producers usually advertise in different agricultural publications. The demand is more than they can supply. And this is likely to increase on a national and international scale if recent advances in breeding are any indication. Five years ago, anybody that had a bull that cut 25 pounds of, of antler or velvet, you know, was pretty much top of the anywhere here. And we had a velvet competition in uh, Regina here uh, last weekend. And 
it was our first competition and there was a fella rolled in there with a set of horns were over 42 pounds so you can see in the past five years like just by selective breeding and and that sort of thing it's it's really starting to improve and there's plenty of room for people who want to get into the industry a flood of immigrants from hong kong is expected when the british hand over the colony to china in 1997 that equates to a bigger market for elk producers right in their own backyard Wheat producers are now paid a premium price for wheat with higher levels of protein. That makes protein a major concern for wheat producers. Field tests and studies are now going on throughout southern Saskatchewan to find a technique that boosts protein levels. In the past, wheat producers have worked at getting high yields. Recently, the focus has moved to increased protein content because the Canadian Wheat Board, reflecting international marketplace demand, now pays a premium for wheat with increased protein. In past years, you just got paid for the, the based on yields and, and you had a certain basic level above 12% protein, you got grade one if the quality of the grain was good. But in recent years, uh, after a series of wet years, when the protein levels of a lot of the wheat went down, our farmers have been paid based on, uh, they've had a premium for protein, going from about 12% uh, protein up to about 15 or 15.5% 15 protein, they get progressively more money for every half a percent of protein. Things that affect your protein are primarily weather. Water and temperature are the main factors. Uh, if you have high moisture, or high precipitation, then you get high yields and you get low protein. In dry years you have the opposite. You get small grains, you got low yields, you got high protein. In hot years it's the same. You get very high protein and it doesn't really matter how much nitrogen you put on, you have high protein. That's why in this brown soil zone, in the swift current area and all like that, farmers don't usually worry about protein. It's usually high protein. So they get grade one. If you go up into the Melfort area, the black soil zone where it's very high yields, quite often they have to worry about protein. There are things you can do to increase the protein. You can apply fertilizer nitrogen. Or if the soil nitrogen is already high, that tends to give you high protein. But it's not as simple as that. It, when it's moist, the first few increments, up to say 40 pounds per acre of nitrogen you put on, actually decreases the protein because the yields increase so much. Then if you put on more nitrogen, it brings the protein back up. And with rewards reaching $10,000 for top protein levels, wheat producers like Bob Jorgensen are testing methods of increasing protein in their crops. On one section of the field, I put uh, an extra 35 pounds of actual nitrogen on before seeding. And on two other strip, one other strip, I put on 25 pounds of, of actual nitrogen with a dribble method when the crop was about eight inches tall. And on the third strip, I put on 50 pounds of actual nitrogen when the crop was uh, about eight inches high. By varying the intensity of nitrogen and the stage of application, wheat producers hope to gain better understanding of protein levels in wheat. The nitrogen that's taken up at the start of the year, at the start of the, the, the growing season, mainly goes to produce yield. The nitrogen that's taken up around flowering or thereafter mainly goes to produce protein. So if you could put nitrogen on at about shot blade or uh, about uh, heading time, you could increase protein. So if you have a, a year in which uh, the, the rainfall has been good and you think uh, you're going to get big yields, uh, you had an airplane, go over and, and put on some extra nitrogen. And if you take a soil sample, send it to the soil testing lab, you can get a recommendation of how much nitrogen you should put on for an average year. Now, if the farmer is averse to taking risks, then you'll probably just stay with putting on what the, the, the soil test lab suggests. If he's somebody who likes to take risks, you probably up it a bit and figure maybe he's going to get, you know, a wet year and he better put some on to increase his yields and increase his protein if he's lucky. But at what cost? 
it might cost more to put on the nitrogen than the extra money you're going to get for the protein. Uh, Dr. Sellers at our station here did a, another uh, analysis on our data after I had written my paper last year. And he, he costed out how much it was costing him for fertilizer, how much yield increase he was getting for the fertilizer, how much protein premium, how much extra protein premium he was going to get for that fertilizer. And he came to the conclusion that in our area, you're best to just fertilize for yield the protein will take care of itself. You get much more money, extra money, for the yield increase that you're getting from the nitrogen than you get in terms of the protein premium. The research being done by Con Campbell suggests that wheat producers always need to remember the bottom line. But gambling on increased profit from increased protein is a risk wheat producers must examine for themselves. Agribiz will be right back. next edition of Agribiz. Looking at uh, DNA as uh, a method of, of tracking disease resistance. Uh, to get uh, labor is just about physically impossible. They, uh, they don't come, they say they're going to show, they don't show. The yellow that you see in the flame, that's uh, sort of a different color that we noticed from the previous, that's, uh, from the sodium that's in the sample. That's on the next edition of Agribiz. Thank you for watching. I'm Adam Cook. We'll see you next time right here on Agribusiness.